huge goal for Virginia. One of their first face-off wins of the game. They're able to create a bunch of transition. You have McDermott fighting it out. He pops it right to Mikey Thompson, who keeps chugging down the field and gets it to your best outside shooter at the point position. Michael B or Chris Botnick drills the lower corner. He talks about the impact of wing play. And this is the third face-off right now, kind of in a quick period of time for Rand. So the last time he was there, he seems a bit tired. That's why Virginia was able to kind of push it forward. Great sellout by McDermott to knock it to Thompson. Rand certainly looks a little slow now with the X. As we approach the five-minute mark, Virginia with a chance to be a little patient on this offensive set. They send Haldy out there. 32, Matt Kugler, some fresh legs for the Virginia offense. Briggs out there as well. We have not seen a lot of the second midfield in this second half. Well, Virginia really hasn't had the ball too much, so these Bratton brothers and Carroll are pretty healthy, and this just speaks to the confidence Coach Starja has on this line. Waldeck goes out on the switch. Now Jinlet on the ball. Jinlet all over Kugler. Comes out of the box. Stall warning again on Virginia. Last time they turned it over. Stanwick gets Waldeck on the run. Taking their time within the confines of their offense. They haven't totally shut it down yet. And this is the opportunity where you attack for Max. When that stall warning comes on, it's a lot easier to keep in the ball and play effective offense, creating from the backside of the goal. Bocklet moves it around. And they put it in. Coming around. It's Colin Briggs with the goal. Of all the members of the second midfield, Briggs is done the best job this year. He's fast, he's aggressive, strong right-handed tendencies, and he shows some courage there, catching and saying, you know what, I'm gonna take a chance. Trusts himself to make a play, well-placed shot. And early in the game, we were mentioning UVA was just dodging to score for themselves. Last couple goals have been nice passing, so that seems to be more of the style of play they like and feel comfortable doing. Rand and McDermott again. Rand this time right to Walden. Instant, no, Walden cannot bring it in. So a break for Virginia there. And then a tough pass. Good defense by Clawson. Stick inside. Clawson comes up with it. He's got a man right in front of him, and he gets it to Popper, but it's a bad pass. Jinlet can't hold on to it. Stanley good box out there to create the turnover. So both teams now forcing passes with 3.18 left to play. Now's where Stony Brook has to turn up the heat defensively, and they will use a timeout to start organizing some pressure defense. So we will take a break as well. Three minutes and 18 seconds left in regulation. Dom Starge's troops up by two. Enterprise Rent-A-Car for my trip looks expensive. It's not expensive, Mom. They pick us up. Sounds expensive. Pickup's free, Mom. Well, if it's not expensive, why didn't you rent me a bigger car? Mom. Pick Enterprise. We'll pick you up. Crunch time, wheat thins. You and your tasty whole grain. This can only end one way. Wheat thins. Toasted, whole grain, crunch. The crunch is calling. Virginia up by two, and Matt Ward, one of the big reasons for Virginia being the top seed, the emergence of the sophomore out of Westchester County. Yeah, and Chris Bocklet has been uh, a big surprise for this University of Virginia team. He has 49 goals on the year. He's so crafty inside, and you get him in a position to put the ball in the back of the net. Like right there, he's as good as it gets. 
product of John Jay Cross River High School. We've detailed this throughout the year, Quint, but what an experience he had growing up. His brother Mike, a great attackman at Fairfield. His other brother Matt was a defenseman, so one guy taught him the tricks of one position, and then he learned about, you know, how to attack the defenseman from his brother Matt. He, he is a student of the game. He's a guy who uh, pays great attention to the details on offense, whether it's shooting, and I love his technique and his fundamentals uh, with his shooting. He's a good looking a shooter, as you will see, but his off ball game is, is terrific as well. He understands offensive patterns and he works hard on loose balls. He, he does the dirty work as well. That is what's at stake here in the final three minutes and 18 seconds of regulation. Duke, Cornell, and Notre Dame already have their tickets punched for Baltimore. The NCAA Lacrosse Championship continues with semifinal action beginning Saturday, May 29th at 4 p.m. Eastern, live on ESPN2 HD. For more information, go to NCAA.com, the official online home for all 88 NCAA championships. So, Quint, the Seawolves took a timeout there on defense. 318 left, down by two. What's the strategy? You need the ball, and the question is when you pull your goalie. I've seen Virginia with Shamel and Ramel Bratton run circles around, around teams. I've seen them run circles around double teams. Uh, they are tough to stay with here in, in these late game situations. They're so fast and they, they'll, they'll just run and carry. And Dom Stars just still has two timeouts. See under Virginia? You got two dash marks that he will be stalking the referees on the sideline. Mocklet decides to attack. Waldeck with a check. Horrible decision. Just talking about the high cross <laughs> IQ of Bocklet, and that was not the decision. But good hustle by Stanwick on the ride. They're not going to be able to get this ball over midfield, and as soon as I say that, Ginlet does. So we're two for two there. Ginlet now. Stony Brook out of timeouts. Gets it in the box. 2.36 left to go. Virginia went for the goal instead of running time off this game. And something to think about here is it's a two-goal lead, but the way the face-offs face -offs have been going down, that's not your standard two-goal lead. It's more like a one-and-a-half goal lead. So Quint said the Brattons are great defensive midfielders. We might find out right now as Tranquil takes a run at Rommel. Now coming around, shot and a goal. Capitello makes it a one-goal ball game. So the strategy to attack the net backfires on Virginia. You, you got to manage clock and score. Perimeter defense, not bad. Clawson, poor angle play. He's caught ball watching. Watch 27, gets there. He's a fraction of a second late. And Compatello turns the corner, but it starts with just a brutal decision on the offensive end of the field. And now it starts with a face-off, a one-goal ball game. 2-11 left to play. McDermott and Rand. Malfurst waiting on the defensive end, almost conceding. It's three on two right now on this ground ball. Now Malfurst starts to approach the party. Virginia, you try to kill as much time in this face-off X. Only two minutes left. You might as well try Rand to keep still it has up. it. McDermott thought he had to rake it out, but it was under Rand's stick. Now they get a call. A hold. And Stony Brook has a chance to tie it. Crowley. That faceoff started at 2.11 and ended at around 1.42. You better play attention. Trankel. He's been active drawing slides. Stony Brook out of timeouts. Trankel on the invert. shoots Stony Brook with the backup with 106 left to play I think Adam Gettleman's a bit disappointed that one didn't end up on cage so he can save it and get possession Pompatello scored the last goal mm -hmm. draws the double moves it Campbell the great collapse defense Lovejoy with the hit will that be Stony Brook's last chance no they're gonna get it back Lovejoy rushed the clear instead of working some clock. He chucked it down to the other end, so we're going the other way with 42. This is Trankel. Here comes Crowley. Trankel. 
Quick shot right to the stick of Gittleman. A rush shot with 29 seconds left. Now, how patient is Virginia on the clear? 20, 20. 20 to clear, but the clock was at 27 when he made the save. Into the middle of the field, it's Thompson with 15. Thompson gets it over midfield. They can run the clock out. 10 seconds. Adam Gittleman makes the save. Lovejoy with one hit, then Gittleman with the save. Virginia seven seconds away from Baltimore. And Stony Brook had an, had an opportunity here. They get the ball into the position to shoot. They have McBride, who hasn't had a goal all game. Adam, uh, Adam Gettleman has read his shot, his release all day, and what a big stop for the Virginia Cavaliers. The 13th save for Adam Gettleman, and an, an easy save. As long as you're ready, this shot, A, lacked velocity, and B, it wasn't well placed. Again, Stony Brook out of timeouts. So Ricky Sol had to let his players freelance and create on their own. Yeah, really, unless Virginia makes some kind of colossal error here, th this game is done. And, and there's almost no way that Stony Brook can get the turnover and get the ball down the field in seven seconds. Again, on the field is almost, you know, half the story with these Virginia Cavaliers. Last week, an easy win. This one, a final second, final minute, white knuckler, emotionally, Lacrosse-wise, is this kind of what Virginia needed to get back into? I mean, granted, they won, so they'll take it, but emotionally to get into a tight game. Yeah, you know, they came out against Mount St. Mary's, who was a bit overmatched and had an easy go of it, and that was probably easy on them. But in this game, you know, there's a lot on their mind with everything that's happened, and when it gets, starts to get close, you start making mistakes. You make mental mistakes. It's like quicksand. All these things start to happen. They happen fast, and that's why, you know, for them, this is probably good to get back into a close game, but also fight off those emotions they've been struggling with. Sports Center U comes up next. Charlie Parr is out of the cage guarding Bocklet. Seven seconds away from a third meeting with Duke championship weekend four seconds three Shamel puts it on the rug to end it the Cavaliers survive and advance the top seed was tested big time by the Stony Brook Seawolves but Adam Gettleman had one save left and Virginia is heading to Baltimore Say, Gittleman made three stops over the course of this ball game. Remember those two big one-on-one -on -one stops and then the one at the end. And at a time where Virginia didn't make great decisions, it was Gittleman, and he was just a rock all game long. 13 saves on in the afternoon. But if I had to pick one MVP for the whole game, it's Adam Rand for, for Stony Brook. He was able to control the face-off X. Therefore, they could control the tempo of the game, keep Virginia out of loops and out of sorts. And for him, I, you know, they ended up losing, but without him, who knows where this game would have been. So a great season comes to an end for the Stony Brook Seawolves. We will return to Long Island to wrap up this thriller between Virginia and Stony Brook. Championship weekend is set in Baltimore. Some of the SEC's top athletes compete for a conference title in the men's and women's outdoor track and field championships. Tuesday at 9 on ESPNU. The NCAA Tennis Championships, Tuesday starting at 2 on ESPNU. Is your computer running slowly? Thinking about buying a new one? Don't waste your money. Your computer could be infected with spyware, malware, viruses, registry errors, spam, and pop-ups. You don't need to buy a new computer. Just go to MaxMySpeed.com and find out what's slowing your computer down. MaxMySpeed.com totally cleaned up my system and increased my speed. My computer is lightning fast now. It never crashes anymore. Talk about optimization. My computer isn't even this fast at work. My computer was on its last leg. Now it's like new again. Get your free diagnosis at MaxMySpeed.com and keep your computer running fast. Your free diagnosis at MaxMySpeed.com is easy and fast. Find out what is slowing down your computer with a free diagnosis at MaxMySpeed.com. Don't waste your time with your slow computer. Get your free diagnosis now at MaxMySpeed.com. That's MaxMySpeed.com. 
Virginia gets quite a test from Stony Brook, but moves on with the one goal victory. Now let's head back down to the sidelines with Bob Holtzman standing by with Coach Starja. Well, Dom, congratulations on making it back to the Final Four. First of all, after the emotions of the last three weeks, not only you personally, but also with everything going on in Charlottesville, how does it feel right now? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, Bob. I'm not sure I can take a lot more of this, to be honest. Uh, you know, sometimes in situations like this, you just got to be good enough to win. Uh, give a lot of credit to Stony Brook and Ricky Sold. He's got a great program. He's a great guy. And uh, they played their hearts out today. And I give our kids credit for kind of gutting it out. It never was easy. You know, it seemed like we just couldn't pick up a face off at all. Uh, you know, they seemed to have an answer every time we, we would get a little bit of a lead and look like we might get control of the game. They came back and got one on us. Uh, but, but we kept battling with, and, and we never gave in, and uh, certainly for us to be uh, still playing at this time of year, that's the point. Another week of practice now. Where's the energy of your team after the past few weeks? Well, I'm going to guess we're going to need a day or so to get, to get uh, past this one. we got graduation tomorrow, certainly a day to recover. Uh, we're just going to have to turn around and keep playing. That, that's what this time of the year demands is that you got to get ready to go and you got to go hard. You beat, you beat Stony Brook by five goals early in the season. What was the difference today? Why so difficult? It just seemed like we struggled a lot. You know, we, we weren't lucky shooting the ball early. I uh, thought we had some chances. We could have stretched the lead out early in the game. Their goalie came up. We just missed a couple. We were in the crease. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and then they just, uh, just kind of kept coming back. It was their field and a good crowd. And they, 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 uh, they fed on that emotion a little bit. And, uh, again, credit to them, I think, for making a lot of plays. Tom, congratulations. We'll let you go shake hands. Thank you very much, Bob. Hey, fellas. Hey, so we take a look at the bracket. It will be the third meeting this year between Virginia and Duke. The regular season matchup in Charlottesville, all Duke. The ACC semifinal rematch, all Virginia. This time it's for a spot in Championship Monday on the line between these two ACC rivals. You know, a lot of people are going to say, oh, that game's the de facto national championship game. I would not go there, and I will not... We've learned. We've learned. You can't do that. It's it's their games. You, you can't look ahead in the bracket. Yes, Notre Dame and, and, and Cornell are aren't seated as high, but but you know should be a great weekend in Baltimore. And again, I think uh, Virginia next week against Duke is going to have to do a much better job on faceoffs. And that was what won the game for Duke in the first game. And then a week later, Virginia came out on top on the faceoff. So that's going to be the key, in my opinion. In the words of the coach, Virginia gutted it out. Our final score: Virginia 10, Stony Brook 9. Coming up next. Sports Center U. The preceding has been an exclusive presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For Quint Kessenick, Matt Ward, Bob Holtzman, and our entire ESPN U crew, I'm Eamon McEnany. So long from Stony Brook. Virginia advances to the NCAA semifinals. Now let's join Lowell Galindo and Mark Dixon in the studio. This is Sports Center U. Guys, thank you so much and welcome into the Sports Center U studios. I am Lowell Galindo. This is the former Hopkins midfielder, Mark Dixon. We are expecting a stiff test for Virginia. Stony Brook gave that and then some. This game coming down to the final moments. Really so many stellar performances all across the board you can talk about for Virginia. You had Shamel Bratton really setting the tone. Matt Lovejoy, great defense in about the final minute of that game to secure this win. You look though big picture. How did Virginia ultimately get this win? Just an outstanding lacrosse game, and Virginia stepped up to the plate. They got up 5-1. to one. Credit Stony Brook. They fought back, won the face-off battle, and put pressure on that Virginia defense all day long. But in the end, Virginia makes the plays. And Adam Gittleman, the anchor of the defense, makes a huge stop. Outlet pass. This is a two-goal turnaround. Makes a save on the doorstep. They start the transition. Then finishing at the other end, Chris Bocklet. Outstanding transition. But Stony Brook. Brook was not going to go away. Kevin Crowley showing why he's a Tuarton finalist ties the game at eight apiece. Ensuing faceoff, however, here comes Mikey Thompson down to Chris Bocklet. Transition again for the Cavaliers gets the job done. Then late in the game, Gittleman, the junior from Cold Spring Harbor, makes a huge save on Jordan McBride. Virginia punches their ticket, but not after they take some hits themselves from the Stony Brook Seawolves. And this was a 5-1 lead for the Virginia Cavaliers. Ultimately, though able to withstand that rush from Stony Brook. There was a large contingent of Seawolves fans there. We saw going into the half, little taunting going on by a pocket of fans at Stony Brook. Nothing that seemed completely out of the ordinary, but Virginia, in the words of Dom Sarge, 
Georgia able to gut it out, get this win. And the final four is complete. So the matchups coming up in Baltimore, Maryland will look like this. You've got Virginia and Duke. That is the ACC matchup. Big mental hurdle cleared for Virginia with that win over Duke. It was eight straight losses for Virginia against Duke heading into the ACC tournament. That game is set next Saturday, 6.30 Eastern time on ESPN2. Then starting before that, Notre Dame and Cornell. You will see that game 4 o'clock Eastern time from Baltimore. Cornell, Notre Dame set to go. For Virginia, though, let's go back to this matchup coming up against the Duke Blue Devils. Virginia, the number one overall seed. From that, you would say they are the favorite. But what did it mean for this team to snap that eight-game losing streak they had head-to-head -head with Duke in the ACC tournament? Well, they've just struggled against Duke mightily over the last couple of seasons. An eight-game losing streak, as you mentioned, and they had always been out virginia by Duke, outran, outperformed, out-executed, but in the win in the ACC tournament, Virginia was able to win the ground ball battle and win the face-off battle. Again, it comes down to face-offs and ground balls, possession and hustle plays. Virginia right now are making those plays, as is Duke. This is tr a tremendous national semifinal. We'll see next Saturday. We will have a complete breakdown of the Final Four coming up. More lacrosse your way, but right now, want to head out to the Seattle Regional because we have an elimination game right now between North Carolina and Nebraska. It is the top of the eighth inning. It went to extra innings. North Carolina with a one zip lead. Winner advances and will take on the defending champs Washington in the next game, the regional finals. Now let's send you out live to Kara Capuano. Lowell, thank you so much. Kara Capuano alongside two-time Olympic gold medalist Michelle Smith. And Michelle, we just saw something very special, which we will bring you, the viewer, as soon as possible. But North Carolina has just taken a lead in this game in the top of the eighth inning. The leadoff hitter for the Tar Heels, Kelly Wheeler, the home run leader for the Tar Heels, hit a solo shot to put North Carolina on the board. one nothing right now. And Stephanie Murad is the second batter of the inning facing Nebraska's Ashley Hall. Hageman. And Hageman rings her up. First out of the inning, the strikeout looking. It's been an exceptional pitching effort today, yet again from North Carolina ace Danielle Spaulding. Yeah, Danielle Spaulding just been has been so just stellar in the circle. I mean, she has had three great games so far in this tournament, including the loss to Washington yesterday, and including a no-hitter pitched against these Nebraska Cornhuskers on Friday. Brittany Robinson flies into left field. Tori Tyson is under it, and we told you about it. Let's show it to you. A towering shot off of the bat of Kelly Wheeler to lead off the inning. Well, Kelly Wheeler takes this pitch. It's a complete miss, supposed to be on the outside corner, and it's just laid up over the white, and Wheeler just tattoos it over the center field fence. And that's exactly what North Carolina needed to get on the board. Just the second hit of the game. But boy, if you're going to get your second hit, make it count. And Willer did just that. Two outs now, and we're at the bottom of the lineup for North Carolina. Constance Orr is the hitter. First time we've seen Orr in the Seattle Regional in the Tar Heels starting lineup. Orr playing first base in this game. Brittany McKinney, who had been playing the designated player for North Carolina, is catching the game, and that leaves the DP spot for Allie Blake. Blake, the other player who has a hit for Carolina. Four fans that one back, fouls it off of our roof, if anybody at home heard that little noise. <laughs> So Danielle Spaulding has now no hit in Nebraska for 14 innings. You can include the Friday seven and the seven today. Yeah, absolutely. If that home run would have come in regulation in the first seven innings, she would have already booked her second no hitter of the regional tournament in the second against Nebraska. Or gets under one toward the left fielder Tyson running up on it now. She misread it, but she makes the play basket catch style, and that will end the inning. But the damage has been done. Kelly Wheeler leading off the eighth with a solo home run. Her team lead leading 13th of the season. And we take a look at how it's mapping out today towards the regional final in Seattle, Washington. The number three overall seed and defending national champion Huskies await the victor of this game. Now, typically, of course, 
The final elimination game is played on the second day of a regional. An almost three hour rain delay last night would have started this fifth game of the regional, Michelle, at about 11.55 local time. The coaches decided, you know what, <laughs> forget about it. <laughs> and of course, more weather blew in. Yeah, and, and you know, you don't want the kids playing at three o'clock in the morning thing. Game ends up going long or there's another rain delay. It's, it's just certainly not fair. I think that the NCAA and the coaches made a really good decision to pick this game up uh, today and, and get it in before the championship game. And uh, you know, if you're in the loser's bracket, you know, that you know it's a long road. You know you're gonna have to stay on the field. And uh, both these clubs prepared. So I don't think it really matters if you play it late last night or early this morning. And of course, the victor of this game does advance to play the University of Washington. However, if they beat Washington, that would then be a third game played in the same day. That's correct. And you know, again, it's probably not best case scenario what you want your kids to have to go through, but it is the regionals and when weather blows through, you have to adapt and change. And you know, a lot of times you hear coaches tell their kids, we have to be flexible. We have to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. And not the first time in this year's field of 64 and in this regional round this weekend that we've seen games stopped, continued the next day. It happened in the Columbus Regional. Danielle Spaulding steps into the circle, hoping to close it out for North Carolina. She's already amassed 17 strikeouts in this game. Yeah, she's just been phenomenal.